The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message by Beth Coppage. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites, had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. Key, key, key phrase. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was successful. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper. So Joseph found favor in his sight and he served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he, that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Then he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now, that is a fairly strong picture of trust. Okay, now the, the scene changes a little. Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and very subtly said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look. My master does not even know what is with me in this house. He has committed everything to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against you? Is that what he says? Sin against me. Sin against Potiphar. Sin against whom? God. So it was as she spoke to Joseph just every once in a while, twice a week, day after day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, none of the men were in the house, and she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled, and he ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled, that she called to the men of the house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that he lifted his, that I lifted my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me, and he fled, and he went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought us to come into me, brought to us, came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was roused. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. The key phrase again. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him in the favor of the sight of the keeper of the prison. And you want to say, big deal. Uh, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did. The keeper did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with Joseph, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Then the next is about the interpretation of the dreams, and then I'd like to le- read the last verse of the next chapter, 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Dear Lord Jesus, this incredible passage of Scripture, we ask, dear sweet Jesus, would you come and teach our hearts today? Would you say to us today what only you can say? 
And we pray that you would open the word to us and that we might not be the same after we have heard what you have to say. Thank you for the godly life of Joseph. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 37. Realized how Joseph had ended up in Egypt. Remember, he had been the favored son of his father. His father loved him dearly. This was Rachel's first son. And he loved him dearly and gave him that coat. And the brothers hated him because he was the favored son. And then remember that his his brothers-in-law were doing something wrong. And Joseph had a sense of justice and right. And he reported on to his fathers what they were doing wrong. And then he had two dreams. And he shared with his family, thinking that it was a safe place to share that and to tell them what uh, about his dreams. And it was not a safe place to share. The brothers envied him, the scripture says, and hated him. In that one chapter, they hated him three times and they envied him. Now, what does this say to us? I think as we look at the person of Joseph, we can get a picture of what it looks is like to look at a man who has an undivided heart, a man who chooses God, a man who the New Testament talks about in the Old Testament as well, is one who has been made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And we see it not so much as Scripture giving, gives, giving us accountings of Joseph's encounters with God like he did with Jacob at Bethel and then again at Peniel, but we see it in the fruit of this man's life. And you see it against a backdrop of incredible adversity and still what comes out of Joseph's life is the sweetness and the presence of God. And I think what God is saying is he gives 14 chapters to this prince among men in all of Holy Scripture is that God is able by the power of his spirit to make you and I, men and women, holy. And that we do not have to live below the privilege that God, by the power of the blood of his own son, has given us. We do not have to live Less than that. God can holify us, even us. And we have talked about the life of Jacob. The chapter 38 that is an interruption in this story, so to speak, is Judah as he commits incest with Tamar. And you get against the backdrop of that incest and the backdrop of a man who can't wait to have his sexual needs met, you get the man Joseph. And I'd like us to look and just see some of the characteristics. Almost every chapter is a vignette dealing with some part of God's dealings with Joseph's life and how Joseph comes through it for Jesus' sake. And I think it gives us hope. If God can do that in Joseph's life before there was scripture, before there was um Jesus died on the cross, before even the coming of the Holy Spirit, if God could do that for Joseph, there is not an excuse or reason that God could not do that in us. Is that not good news? That is good news. Now, what do we know? Let's look at some of the things that it means to have a holy heart or an undivided heart and some of the things that it means not to. One, if you and I have an undivided heart, Joseph had an undivided heart, I think even in chapter 37, but it did not remove from him youthful indiscretion and immaturity. And if you and I come to the place where we say, I want all of you've got for me, God, I want you to make me your woman. I want you to make me holy yours and holify my whole life. I want to belong to you and be yours. It does not mean that we will have perfect performance. Did we hear that? It does not mean perfect judgment, perfect motivation all the time. It does not mean perfect performance. It does not mean perfect maturity. It just means we have a heart seeking God. And there was youthful indiscretion and immaturity in chapter 37. His family wasn't a safe place to share. He didn't realize that. He didn't realize it. And he he should have had more discretion. 
he kind of added fuel to his brother's own hurt and their own envy and their own anger. He wasn't old enough to know that. But God can use you and I even if we don't have perfect performance and even if we fail and things don't work out even though our hearts are right. God can still use that for his good and our glory. We can see this in our children. I remember one time I was reading in the backyard and the kids were down. They were little. The younger two were little. And they were down for a rest period. It was like a summer afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. And all of a sudden, out of the back window floats balloon. And looked and he knew it had been Susanna's balloon. And But he saw out the window throwing the sister's balloon out the window. So he got up and he says, what are you doing throwing Sue's balloon away? That's not your balloon. And he's, and Al gave him a little lecture. And then after he finished giving him a little lecture, he goes, Daddy, I wrote a note on the bottom of the balloon. Would you read what's on the string? So he all went and grabbed the balloon before it drifted off to the heavens. And on the bottom it says, Dear Daddy, I love you with my heart you are my favorite daddy in the whole world love billy now his motivation was pure but it probably wasn't he wasn't supposed to just send off his sister's balloon but there's is that not how we serve jesus now did then he said i am sorry thank you very much there was not perfect performance but there was perfect motivation of the heart he was expressing to his father his love for him And that is what you and I can do. And when you and I, God fills us with his spirit and sanctifies our hearts, and we kneel at little chairs here, we kneel at the altar, when God meets us and he fills us with his spirit, it doesn't mean from thenceforth forevermore, you will have perfect wisdom, perfect discretion, or perfect performance. Only God has that. And when you don't make it and you fail, just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. And God looks at our heart just look like we look at our children's hearts. Then the next thing we notice is, if you and I love Jesus with an undivided heart, will everyone love us? No. And in fact, if your heart is all God's, what will ha- begin to happen in your life and in my life is that there will some that love you with a passion and are so grateful for what God has done in your life, because your presence near them draws them closer to Jesus himself. But there will be some just like the brothers who hate you and envy you. And so that as you enter into the walk of full surrender, there will be a division that will come and some will gravitate toward you like flies to honey. But there will others that that have been your friends and all of a sudden you will think, why is it there is this divide? And do not be sad about, you will be grieved about that, but do not be surprised by that. Is that not what happened to the Lord Jesus himself? And Jesus said, when I come, will I not bring a sword with me to divide in the fact that some choose Jesus and some do not? And when Jesus comes into a life, there are some that choose Jesus and then some choose not to follow Jesus. And the ones that do not follow Jesus, they hate the ones that do. And that is what put Jesus on the cross. It was the religious leaders. They didn't want to have clean hearts. They wanted to have religious formality and they didn't like Jesus. He was a threat to them. And so they they helped nail him to the cross. There was a Judas right in the inner band who betrayed him. Just like these brothers betrayed uh, Joseph in the inner circle, there was one that betrayed the Lord Jesus. We do not need to lose heart over that we just need to realistically realize when you are all gods it does not mean that everyone will love you scripture says in the new testament follow peace with all men that means as much as you and i are able to we are to be a promoters of peace but we are not able to not everyone will love us 
so that we have to come to the place that we can learn to live with rejection by the power of God. And that was an astounding new thing to me and one of the most freeing things in my life when I finally realized that if we walk with God, not everyone will choose to love us and that you and I can do all that we can do, but there will some that have the right to choose. No, I just, I just don't want to be your friend. But it doesn't need to stop our still loving them. It just means that we need to give them the freedom to choose. God does. And even if those that we long to have choose to love us and support us, do not, even as Joseph's family did not understand and choose to love him and support him, even if your family does not, you and I can live with the rejection of it as we nestle our hearts, broken though they may be, into the heart of Jesus and let him fill that place that normally loved ones could fill, but they are not. Does that make any sense? If we take that rejection and say, Jesus, would you come and fill the hurt in my heart? And Lord, let me please you. I can't seem to please everybody else. Will you let me please you? And then when we stop trying to please everyone else and seek to truly please him. And then when we walk with God, he will not remove envy from those around us. And this, I got a sweet thing from one of our gals. Do you know, even among us, as God moves among our hearts, and we see how God begins to use one gal to do this and one gal to do that and another gal to do this, there can be envy in the body of believers. Why does God bless her and he doesn't bless me? Why is God using her and he isn't using me? Why, I wish she was doing such and such in my life. I'd like to sing. I'd like to run the tape sound system. I'd like to teach. I like, why is God just overlooking my qualifications? Remember the story of the little wormwood and, um, where the, the devils were trying to tempt this very precious monk, Catholic monk. So the younger devils were all coming to the monk and they were tempting him with lust. They were tempting him with all the sins of rebellion. They were tempting him with drugs they were tempting him with all these things and they weren't having any success at all so they took this case they were going to fail so they took this case to an older hellion <laughs> and they said what what are we doing wrong he said aha i know the ultimate trick and so they all gathered round this demon went to the monk's room and the monk was at his prayers very clean heart seeking God and the little thought came into his mind put there by the evil one did you realize your brother your own brother has been made the bishop and it threw him Envy is not just a problem of Joseph's brothers. Envy is a problem in all of our hearts. Only Jesus can keep our hearts clean. And I think this helps. Listen to this. This is a little... I realized then that all the flowers God has made are beautiful. The rose in its glory, the lily in its whiteness, Don't rob the tiny violet of its sweet smell or the daisy of its charming simplicity. I saw that if all these lesser blooms wanted to be roses instead, nature would lose the gaiety of springtime. There would be no little flowers to make a pattern all over God's countryside. And so it is with the world of souls, which is God's garden. He wanted to have great saints to be his lilies and roses, 
but God needs others as well, saints that are content to rank as daisies and violets, lying at his feet and giving pleasure to God's eye. Perfection comes, our perfection, simply in doing God's will and being just what God wants me to be. (laughs) Isn't that precious? So that we can let Jesus come into our hearts and he can make some of us lilies, some of us daisies, some of us roses, some of us hollyhocks, some of us daffodils. And then we don't say, well, I wish that I were other than I am. Jesus, let me be the very best flower in your garden that you have made me to be. And then we can rejoice when God uses one in one way and one in another. And so that out of our hearts, there's not envy, but we sense I am part of who God made me to be. And my perfection and fulfillment comes in simply doing in God's will and being what God wants me to be. Okay. Being an, having an undivided heart did not remove tremendous temptation from Joseph's path. And in this chapter, this pivotal chapter, this man who's been betrayed by his family, who's ended up being kidnapped, he's away from home. This pivotal chapter, it says over and over again, God was with him. Because you know Joseph was weighing in his soul, what am I going to do? Am I going to drink the cup of bitterness? Or am I going to trust God with the unexplained mystery of this suffering in my life? And so what we find is that he is bought and put into Potiphar's house. And there is no, there's no scene in scripture about him wrestling through whether he would trust God or not. All we see again is the fruits of that trust. And what happens? He gives himself fully to being a slave. He does exactly what Colossians 3 says. He said he worked at it with all his heart. Whether he was in this, a slave to Potiphar, or whether he was in the prison, or he was in the exchequer of Egypt, he did it with all his heart. And so that what we find here is that Joseph was successful The Lord was with him and the presence of God was so real in his life that even the non-Christian Egyptian Potiphar knew it. And there was a sense of incredible trust that he put into the man's life. Now, as he's in this situation, working for God, doing what's right, what happens? Temptation comes. And do you know if you and I live in a lost and broken world, The places that the devil's going to try to wipe us out is bitterness and family relationships. And that pain is incredible pain. And injustice in family relationships. Suffering when you don't deserve to suffer. And then the next place the devil's going to try to wipe you and I out is temptation with sexual sexual sin. And in our day and age, it's almost like, can anyone be pure in this area? And I think God puts this in scripture to say, yes, there is a power in myself and in the spirit of the power of the Lord Jesus and through the Holy Spirit that God can make you and I pure. And so what happens in Joseph? This Potiphar's wife comes and says, lie with me. She's just not subtle as spec. She just wants to have sex with Joseph and she just comes after him day after day after day after day. And Joseph could have said, if there was any root of bitterness there, he could have said, well, I deserve it. After all, what's God ever done for me? I was doing what was right and here I end up a slave in this house. And if I'm ever going to have any political advancement, I better not anger the Potiphar's wife, I better walk on eggshells here and do exactly what she wants me to do. If there's going to be any personal advancement in my life at all, I better just sin against God, sin against Potiphar, sin against her, 
sin against myself and just sin. And that is exactly what our society tells us today. And that is what exactly the non-Christian world and sometimes the Christian world says. And do you know what God is saying? He is saying, you and I, by the power of the Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can live with unmet sexual needs and unmet emotional needs. And we do not have to sin. And you and I need to get to the place where he do, we do just what Joseph did when the temptation came on with a, with fury. He fled. And there are some temptations we cannot handle. We need to flee. And you and sexual sins are exactly like that. You can be, have your devotion every single day. You can be prayed up. But you put the right man and the right woman together and you have a lonely military woman and you have a lonely slave far away from home and you put that chemistry together and it is only the supernatural grace of God and one of them fleeing that keeps you from sin. And we need to be aware of it. What do you read? Remember when one of our missionaries came home and she said she was so excited to get some American magazines and begin to read because she just wanted to touch base and read something that wasn't, I think she was in Korea, that wasn't in Korean. And she got home and began to read and she said, I thought I can't read that one. And she picked up another one. She said, I can't read that one. Picked up another and said, I can't read that one. Is there a sensitivity in you and I towards sin? I can remember as a college kid picking up a book that I got at one of the libraries even in town. And I began to read it and all of a sudden I got to a chapter and I thought, I, the Lord said, you are not to finish it. And I remember closing it tight and saying, no God, I am not to finish that book. Because there is something about sexual sin. Once it gets into our minds, it is Very, very, very hard to ever get it out. And the best thing to keep our hearts pure is avoid it, to flee it. What do you watch on television? Don't. Just don't. What do you watch in movies? Don't. Just don't. Let there be a purity and a separateness about our lives so that you and I can know God and we can know him in purity and that we can be a pattern for our children and our children's children. And there should never be only mom and dad can watch because you're not old enough to watch it. If you've said that to your children, you should not watch it either. There needs to be soul purity and Joseph fled. And the enemy, you get out from here or if you get on the job or you get in a church, the enemy will throw people across your path and there will be emotional attachments. He will say to you, Oh, well, your needs aren't being met in your husband. You deserve more than this. After all, God wants every woman happy. He will give you a litany of things that sound right, and they are absolutely wrong, and they will bring death and destruction to your life. Flee sexual sin. And for every unmet need in your life, you go to Jesus Christ and just tell him, Jesus, I'm lonely. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, will you come and will you meet the deepest needs of my heart? And Jesus will. He will. That is the privilege of the woman of the undivided heart. God can meet those unmet needs. And there are many women that are widows in a marriage. There are unmet emotional needs. A man doesn't mean it to be malicious, but he just doesn't have a clue how to plug in. Don't don't just say, Jesus... This need isn't met in me. This need isn't met in me. This need isn't met in me. Give them to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you come in your sweetness? Would you meet those needs in me? And would you begin to let me know how to love that husband that you've given me, whether he ever meets one of those needs or not? Will you give me Calvary love so that it's not selfish love, I'll love you because you meet me. And when you meet me right, then I'll love you the way I want to love you. All that it is sheer self-love. But if God could begin to make you and I as women move into the dimension of whether your needs are met or not, your needs can be met in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you don't honestly share where you are, but it means we remove the line of expectation. 
you have to jump through this hoop and this one and this one, and then I'll respond. And it, that's wrong. God wants us to become women that even this area of our life is marked with the cross and he sets us free. And do you not know there is no other power on earth that can make us free in this area of our life but the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. But if you and I have an undivided heart, God can keep us pure. And if there is sin there that has come in, God can cleanse and purify you, even today, from all sexual sin. He can purify your heart, your mind, your soul, and your body. And we don't have to live that way any longer. God can set us free. Then the next thing that happens is he does what's right. And he suffers for it. Now that's a that's a low blow. <laughs> he flees and he is slandered. He is talked about maliciously. And then he is unjustly thrown into prison and unjustly punished. And if you and I live long enough and God gives us enough years, sooner or later, if you walk with God and walk the undivided heart walk, there will come a time when you will do what's right and you will pay the consequence for it. And it will not be good consequences. You will suffer and you will suffer unjustly. But once again, did Joseph get bitter? No. And he ends up in the prison because he does what's right. And God blesses him in the prison and honors him in the prison so that he's made the head of the guard. <laughs> and that warden over him is the only one over him. And he's in charge of everything in the prison. And God was with him in the prison. And there can come tremendous bitterness and hurt in our hearts when we do what's right, and then instead of being received warmly and sweetly and appreciated and being blessed by God in ways we expected, not being blessed in prison, do you know what happens? It's very hard not to get a bitter spirit against God and against other people. Is it not? And that's where we need to come to him and say, Jesus, only you, only you can turn my heart so it thinks on you and doesn't think about the people who hurt me or the injustice I've suffered for doing what's right. Remember this story in Corey Ten Boom? Remember when they were in the concentration camp, Betsy and Corey? And little Betsy um, had tuberculosis and was getting... In, very near the end of her life. And um, she had to go out every day for roll call. Early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, it was winter. She'd already started spitting up blood. And so two of the girls would go out with her, Bet, uh, Corey and another friend, to help her just get to roll call, and then they had to separate for her to stand. And after roll call, then she was supposed to a dig and dig in this frozen dirt and and dig where well, she wasn't able to. And so she'd try, but even to lift the shovel was very difficult and just a little bit would get on it. Well, one day, after this excruciating roll call and then they were put to work digging in the frozen ground, a guard came over and looked down at her shovel. There was very little on it and began to harass her, say, you are lazy, and 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 then took a, a, a whip and just began to beat Betsy. And um, welts occurred across her little back. And when they stopped, Corey ran to her in a rage filled with hatred looking at the welts across her beloved sister's back. And she was getting ready to just go after the guard, picked up the shovel, and Betsy took her hand and said, Corey, 
Don't look at the wealth. Look only at Jesus. Only at Jesus. Look up, Corey. Only at Jesus. And do you know what that secret, the secret, when you and I are emotionally hurt, when we are battered, when we do what's right, we cannot look at the situation either. Even we cannot look at the people involved. All we can do is just look up, not at the welts and the bruises, but look only at Jesus. And I think that's what Joseph had to do in that prison. He had to just keep looking up. And even though he was trusted with the mystery of unexplained suffering, just like Job, he didn't fail. He kept looking only at Jesus. Do you know how often it is when you and I get hurt to such an incredible degree that we move into the realm of depression? Even if an anger that goes down, instead of just being raging bitterness outside, it goes into depression and despair. Do you know how difficult it is when we've been hurt so deeply to think about anyone other than ourselves? Incredibly difficult. And what do we have in chapter 40? He is made captain of the prison. He's the chief warden. He is doing it with all his heart. He is doing a very good job. It's very hard when you've suffered such abuse as he'd suffered to even do anything rather except lay on your bunk. And he is not allowing himself that self-indulgence. He gets up. He is caring for the needs of the prison. And then there's an intriguing verse in verse 6. Joseph came in to the Pharaoh's butler and baker who were in prison, and he saw they were sad. <laughs> so he asked them, Why are you sad? Do you know what? That's a, that's like Jesus. Where even though there's tremendous pain in Joseph's own life, God has met him in such a way that he is able, in a place full of incredible sadness, to see that even these two were more sad than usual. And then to have the capacity to say, why are you sad? And to reach out to another. And I just... And so he reached out to them and they shared their dream, their two dreams. They'd had two dreams. The butler had dreamed that he had baskets on his head or blossoms on his head, grapes, and then he pressed them in three days. He put a cup in Pharaoh's head. And Joseph said, in three days you'll be back with the Pharaoh. And he said, would you remember me? I'm unjustly put in this prison. Would you just remember me to Pharaoh that I might be able to leave? And then the baker gave his dream a basket and there were bread in the basket and the birds came and ate the bread out of the basket. And Joseph said in three days, your head will be lifted up from you and you will be hanged. And in Pharaoh's birthday came and exactly what Joseph said happened. And one was lifted up, the butler, and one was hanged. I even appreciate that about Joseph. Joseph honestly said to each man his dream. I would have had trouble telling that baker that dream. But I mean, there was such an honesty in him. I, he could not do anything but say exactly what was the truth. But do you know what happened? The butler forgot Joseph. He ignored him. The man he befriended, even in Joseph's own pain, the one that he had given to, the one that he had encouraged, and then the minute the man gets out of the prison, he immediately forgets Joseph. Have you ever been forgotten? Have you ever been ignored? Have you ever been incredibly disappointed. Two years he sat waiting for a butler to remember him. 
to use. But scripture does not give any indication he got bitter even with incredible disappointment. Is there any incredible disappointment in your life or mine? Someone who's hurt us, someone you keep expecting to come through for you, and then they don't come through, and they don't come through. Someone you're longing that they will grow in the Lord, and they don't quite make it, and you pray, and you talk, and you work, and they don't seem to go anywhere. After a while, you get incredibly disappointed with them and even with God. Or you wait for God to break in on circumstances that are so painful and life that is so disappointing and then God doesn't move in and God doesn't move in and there are things that seem hopeful and then it doesn't, nothing happens and years go by and you live with incredible disappointment, forgotten. It's a very difficult thing. But yet God gave Joseph grace. Grace even to be forgotten. Grace to be rejected. Grace to go through temptation. Grace to be forgotten. God gave him grace. Do you know what? I think and the end was not yet. It gets better. And do you know what? God hasn't got the whole picture in your life is not over yet. And God may allow, just like he allowed in Joseph's life, where he gave him the vision in chapter 37, a little inkling to that sensitive 17-year-old of what might be coming in his life. And then he gave him 13 years of the death of a vision. And 13 years he put him in the crucible of every kind of suffering imaginable. And when he finished with that crucible, what he had was a man after God's own heart. A humble man, a broken man, a man he could entrust with incredible power, and it wouldn't go to his head, a man that God could use. And do you know what? Some of you sitting here these days, God may have given you a vision, and yet you think, this isn't what I envisioned at all. We're going through incredible difficulties. Nothing in my life is what I've seen. I thought it would be. God's allowing a cup after cup of sorrow for me. Why is it? And we need to not let go of Jesus during those times. Not let bitterness or despair come in, but only seek his face and his presence and trust him with the mystery of unexplained suffering. Trust God. Do you remember the story, too, of Betsy in Corey Ten Boom's hiding place? She began to get a vision. <laughs> of a beautiful, beautiful house with inlaid floors, with beautiful grounds, with a big um, stairway, big, beautiful stairway going upstairs with hardwood um, paneling all throughout and woodwork all throughout this beautiful home with big floor-to-ceiling windows. And she told Betsy, she told Corey about it. And Corey said, well, where is this vision? Is it in heaven? Oh, she said, no, it's here. And it's for when the war is over, we're going to go and we're going to take in people and we're going to let be part of their healing. And they're going to come to that house and God's going to heal them. And another day they had roll call. Remember the story? And one of the women in the roll call was simple-minded and she soiled her pants while she was standing in the line. And the guard came over and beat her mercilessly until she was a little clump on the ground. And Corey began to cry. And she said, Oh, Betsy, when we get out, 
we'll fill that home with those people like we did before the war. The ones that are simple-minded. The ones that are broken. The ones that have no one to care for them. And Corey looked at Betsy and she said, Betsy looked at Corey and said, when we get out, we will fill that home with them. And she was looking at the guard. Corey said, I don't want to fill that home with them. She said, I know, but Jesus wants us to. And she said, Corey, by the first of the year, we'll both be free. Corey was a lady. And sure enough, by the first of the year, they both were free. Betsy was with Jesus in heaven. And Corey, through a fluke of, of the system, was set free instead of going to the gas chamber. And she made it back to Holland. And she got a call from a woman to come for tea. And she went, and she went to the woman's home. And she said, oh, entered into the grounds. And she said, I've been here before. She said, would you have inside your house inlaid floors like this? She said, would you have tall ceil- windows to the floor to the ceiling? Why, yes. Would you have a mahogany staircase to the second floor? Would you have Window boxes in each window. She said, yes, you've been here before. She said, yes, my sister's been here. She told me of your home. She walked in the house and the woman said, I want to give this to you. I want to give it for the care of people that were hurt in the war. And Corey said, yes, I know. It's for the guards. It's for the ones that beat us. It's for the ones that hurt us. For the very ones that put the welts on Betsy's back. And she said, see, only Jesus, only Jesus. And do you know what? That's exactly what happened. And is that not a picture of the life of Jesus and the life of Corey and Betsy Ten Boom? A true Christ-centered living. Because the world knows nothing about people who can be hurt, who respond without bitterness. The world knows nothing about people who have been hurt, who can forgive. The world knows nothing about people who have been hurt, who can love and expect nothing in return. And that is what the world is looking for, you and I, to so have an undivided heart that the heart of Jesus would be our heart and that in those kind of awful circumstances, what comes out is the sweetness, the forgiveness, the holiness of Jesus' love, the very responses that Jesus had even this week to Golgotha, to Gethsemane, to Calvary. He did it for us. And there are times in our lives God calls us to let the cross touch our lives so strongly that our responses become His responses so that a broken world can see Jesus in action in your life and mine. Today, this Holy Week, could we take the hurts and bruises, legitimate ones, the unjust suffering, and could we offer it to Jesus as red roses, And say, Lord, would you give me godly responses to the pain and hurt in my life? And Jesus, 
Will you help me to get my eyes off that pain and look up, look up to see Jesus?